honor to have you, Stephen. Uh, please join me in welcoming you. Great. Well, thank you very much, Dan, and thanks to KSU for the opportunity to come and speak with you today. Uh, it's a distinct pleasure for me because, as Dan said, I've been going there a long time and I always enjoy the opportunity to come and talk with other people about uh, what I see happening there, especially in the domain of education, which I think has been especially active over recent years. Here's our guy, L.S. Vygotsky. Um, and who is he? Well. He's a really amazing uh, thinker and scientist who was active at the beginning of the 20th century. He lived in a really turbulent time for Russia and for the world generally, and he developed a set of ideas that continue to resonate today and have very strong influence in a number of fields, psychology, education, uh, and other fields as well, as we'll see. And why is he interesting? Well, he was a very influential thinker. His ideas, I think, have been taken up and studied more carefully in the last 20 years than they probably were at the time that he was uh, active at home. Uh, he saw human thought as being worthy of serious attention and a deep study at a time when uh, in other places, including here in the US, uh, psychology was being thought of in a more kind of mechanistic way. He also thought of human activity uh, as being interconnected and uh, aimed at achievement, aimed at, in a sense, the higher domains of human uh, thought and activity. Um, and his work also uh, provides an interesting and maybe informative example of how politics and science intersect. And his name itself kind of points at this uh, uncertainty around uh, him he, we know him in the West as Lev Semyonovich Vygotsky, but it might have been Lev Semyonovich Vygotsky with the accent on the first syllable, or maybe Lev Semyonovich Vygotsky with a D, or Lev Sinkovich Vygotsky. So all of those variants of his name he used at different points in his life. And it's sort of indicative of somebody who had to sort of shapeshift to uh, make his way in the world. He was born uh, in November of 1896 in a little town called Orsha in Mogolyovskaya Gubernia, which is a province uh, now part of Belarus. Um, and he died in 1934 in Moscow. Let's look a little bit at his world. Uh, this town, Orsha, where he was born, was a kind of a small town uh, where his father worked in a bank. And when he was one year old, they moved to a larger town, Gomil, uh, which you know, was about four times the size of the town where he was born. And his father almost immediately dies. They're, they're there for a year, and his father dies. And so he's raised with an uncle and their family and some cousins, one of whom, David, uh, Vygotsky, who uh, later became a very well-known literary critic. And a lot of people think that this had a significant formative influence on Vygotsky himself, because he was, at the beginning of his career, very interested in literature, art, and so on. This was a prosperous, uh, middle-class Jewish family living in what was called the Pale of Settlement, Cherta Siedlosti, which means it's really the place that Jews are allowed to live in Imperial Russia. They've sort of been pushed out of Western Europe, and they settle in this part of Eastern Europe that includes uh, Western Poland, Lithuania, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, uh, and parts of, uh, Eastern, of uh, Western uh, Russia. It's a uh, very kind of uh, hothouse environment in terms of its um, <clears throat> activities, and, and there were also a lot of changes going on in Russian society at this time. Emperor Nicholas II was crowned in 1896, just a few months before Vygotsky was born. The country was changing rapidly at this time. <clears throat> Economy was growing fast. Population was growing fast. A lot of people were moving to the cities. Uh, it was a period of intense industrialization. Foreign governments were investing a lot in Russia, railroads, uh, factories, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> and education was changing. Uh, literacy rates went up from 21% in 1897 to 40% in 1914, 51% in 1926. So people were becoming literate at a, at a relatively fast rate. But that development was not equally distributed. 
cities and towns uh, were very different from the countryside. And there was still a lot of poverty and a lot of um, uh, kind of social differentiation. Russia, at the time that Vygotsky would have been in high school, had just come out of the um, <clears throat> uh, Russo-Japanese War, which was a major military disaster for Russia. It was the first time that a major Western power had pitted itself against an emerging Asian power militarily. Uh, Russians did not react well to that. Uh, <clears throat> there was a lot of pressure from uh, students to uh, make reforms, lots of strikes and demonstrations. Uh, the, Russian, the failed Russian Revolution of 1905, if you've ever seen the film Battleship Potemkin, this, is, this was the period that was shown in that film. Um, <clears throat> lots of strikes, lots of confusion. And the, the Tsar and his advisors were being pressed uh, strongly to provide some outlet for these popular uh, uh, feelings. Uh, the Tsar did consent to the organization of a state Duma, but it didn't really have a lot of power. It was kind of an advisory body. Uh, <clears throat> and the name itself is tied to the Russian word for thinking rather than acting. They're not supposed to be acting on stuff. Uh, they did, the Tsar and his government did issue an, a manifesto in October <clears throat> of 1905, which is shown in this painting by Repin, um, which allowed for the formation of political parties. Uh, which was probably an important step, but also problematic for the regime, ultimately. There were a lot of anti-Jewish pogroms going on uh, and indigenous terrorism. Uh, people were being assassinated. Lenin's own brother was implicated in a plot to kill Tsar Alexander III and was hanged for that. Uh, so things, things were tumultuous. <clears throat> well, what about Vygotsky's early education? It's indicative, I think, also of his his shape-shifting quality that he had a lot of different kinds of educational experiences in his early life. He worked first with a private tutor who was well known as a social activist but also a practitioner of Socratic dialogue. So his early experience in education was not of sitting, listening to someone, it was interacting with someone. Uh, he went to a boys gymnasium, gymnasium just kind of specialized uh, higher academic focus high school and then to a private Jewish gymnasium, and then in 1913, remember he's only 17 years old, he goes to Moscow to study at Moscow University. First studies uh, in the medical faculty, shifts over to law, during this time writes a long manuscript on Hamlet, which eventually gets accepted as a doctoral dissertation. And in 1917, before he graduates, he drops out, and he goes to this place called Shanyavsky Popular University, which was set up by a wealthy but very progressive Moscow merchant, um, and studies uh, history and philosophy, and also languages from private tutors, and studies Esperanto on his own. So he's, he's got a mind that is kind of constantly questing. This uh, Shanyavsky Popular University has an interesting history because it's, uh, uh, it's now the Russian Humanities University, but for many years it was, it was known as the Higher Party School. So it was where the Communist Party sent their upper level managers to get imbued with communist fervor. And when I was there for a conference about 20 years ago, I was in the building and one of my Russian colleagues said, I don't like this place. And I said, why not? He said, it has a bad aura about it <laughs> because it had been this higher party school. But it was, the conference was held there because it was a place that Vygotsky had started. The culture at this time was busy, bustling, blooming, with a lot of different stuff going on. Uh, these movements in art, literature, architecture, typography, design, and so on, constructivism, symbolism, futurism, it was a huge, I, this for me is really my favorite time in, in Russian culture and art and, and uh, architecture, typography, it's, it's wonderful. This is a, a painting by Goncharova, um, artist from uh, early 20th century. Uh, just look at the motion in that. You know, it's like it's, it's vibrating almost. And Tatlin, who was an architect, designed this famous tower as a monument to the Third International. Never got built, but it's, it was supposed to be taller than the Eiffel Tower. Amazing uh, construction. There's some online simulations. You can see people love to work with it and sort of see what, what, is it actually, what would it actually have looked like. A lot of stuff was going on. Per pervasive 
upsetting cultural and intellectual change, and a lot of symbols and signs, new meanings. Look at this. These are posters of the Russian Revolution. The one on the lower uh, left is my favorite. It's uh, Beat the Whites with the Red Wedge by a guy named Lisitsky. I have this on my wall in my office at home as a, you know, as a reproduction. If it were an original, it would be hugely valuable, but it's not. But I love, I love the feeling of power and, and uh, motion and energy that's there. And the one on the right, Kino Glas, uh, is an, uh, an ad for a film um, by a guy named Zika Vertov and, and uh, huge experiments going on in film at this time. Uh, Eisenstein was coming up with new kind of, he came up with the notion of montage in cinema. We'll come back to him later on. Well, how did he get to psychology? <clears throat> his initial interest was in art. Uh, his cousin, as I mentioned, became an influential critic. He wrote on Hamlet and other literary work. He was fascinated, and I think this is really what got him into psychology, he was fascinated by the qualities that engage people in art. Like, what is it that provokes a response? What is it from your past experience and background that triggers a reaction that gets you engaged with that piece of art? He was very interested in theater for this reason, because that was sort of the principal vehicle by which people um, experienced those kinds of, if you will, psychological con confrontations. And there's a whole, there's a whole sort of sub-literature in the Vygotsky and psychology stuff that kind of focuses on this whole issue of response to art. His intellectual heritage comes out of the German psychologists. Remember, this is not a time when you had like specializations within psychology of social psychology and industrial psychology. Psychology is just kind of barely emerging out of, and people aren't sure, is it philosophy? Is it biology? What is it? So this guy, Wundt, Wilhelm Wundt, was a, a really influential uh, psychologist in Germany, and he was really the one who, who championed the experimental method as the approach. In other words, psychologists shouldn't just think, sit in their office in a chair and think about, well, now am I thinking about truth or wisdom? You know, it's, it, they should be actively engaged. <clears throat> um, and he thought also that you had to bring together the physiological aspects of psychology and the cultural elements. That is, how, do, how does human culture regenerate itself and pass things on and so on. We'll come back to that at the very end. <clears throat> Russian psychology at the start of the 20th century was to a large extent uh, focused on the work of people like Pavlov, who was known as a, a reflexologist, debate among contemporary psychologists because we tend to think of his approach as uh, focusing on conditioned reflexes and what he actually said in Russian was uslovnye refleksi, which means conditional reflexes. So slightly different take on that. But the Soviets really liked Pavlov, um, even though he uh, disavowed a kind of heavy-handed control over science. The guy who was really influential in terms of the early development of, of Russian and Soviet psychology is this guy Bekhterev. If you were to imagine, this is a thought experiment, if you imagine what does a Russian scientist look like in the early 20th century? It'd be him, right? He'd look like that. <laughs> I just love him. He's so, he's so big. Um, but uh, he was a neurologist. He was also a psychiatrist, uh, although not a Freudian. Um, and he, made, he famously made a diagnosis at a distance, never talked to him, I don't think, but diagnosed Stalin as a paranoid personality. And uh, a little bit after that, he died under mysterious circumstances. So it's sort of what happened in Russia at that time. But psychology was, in a way, part of this general cultural and intellectual turmoil. And it's important given what was happening in Russia and the fact that it had just gone through this, this uh, crazy revolution uh, which kind of put Marxism in, a, in a, a guiding position to think about the connection between the two. And um, the, the kind of guiding uh, underlying idea of Marxism was that history is determined by natural laws. That is, societies go through a progression of stages uh, from uh, <clears throat> feudalism to uh, uh, capitalism to socialism to communism. So this sense of uh, natural historical laws 
and the primacy of economic relationships, of economic status, of class, consciousness, and awareness um, were really the driving features. And the um, uh, place of psychology in that kind of world was not really very strong. They thought of psychology, the sort of inner world, as largely determined by these external class and social relationships. Um, so they thought of psychology as kind of a bourgeois science. But why then would Vygotsky, who always did, identify himself as a Marxist, although importantly never as a Leninist or Stalinist? Um, well, the society was a mess. Uh, after World War I and the Revolution and the Civil War, a lot of illiteracy still, especially in the countryside, huge amounts of social inequality, <clears throat> big disparities between herbal, uh, urban and rural uh, life. Famine in the 1920s made worse in the late 20s by Stalin's collectivization orders. Uh, Herbert Hoover, by the way, sort of got his uh, stripes by helping alleviate a lot of the Russian uh, famine in the 20s. And an education system that was really not ready to address these kind of this sort of mass need for uh, uh, education. So what to do? The title is uh, <clears throat> reminiscent of both uh, books by Chernyshevsky and, and by Lenin. Uh, <clears throat> how do you get the population ready to move into a new industrialized, organized, socialist world especially if they're illiterate. You know, you really have to cope with the fact that these people don't have the tools that they need. If you're going to put a person who is illiterate into a factory, how are they going to read the little metal plates on the sides of the machines that tell them which levers to push and how to, how to work the tools? Uh, <clears throat> so literacy and numeracy are key in this new world. The, um, the uh, government initiated huge campaigns to get rid of illiteracy. They went under the name of Likbiez, liquidation of illiteracy. And they would run these trains out into the countryside and literally try to teach people in the course of a week or so how to read <coughs> and count. But it was also important for people to know the, uh, <coughs> the language of art, because art was important at this time. It was like you communicate with people not only by giving them a flyer that talks about the glories of socialism, but also by putting on plays or having uh, films that show them. And so you have to give them the language, the tools, to understand these uh, new uh, ways of uh, talking about culture. So Vygotsky saw these, these problems and worked to try to uh, to ad address them and alleviate them, and he um, <clears throat> really developed during this time a kind of developmental perspective that said what we need to do is help people develop these higher mental processes, especially literacy and numeracy. And this he saw as being congruent with Marx's idea of history naturally progressing through stages. But in order to do these things, you had to be interacting with other people. And this also fit in with Marxism's focus on the primacy of economic and social structures. It's important to, re to remember that Vygotsky is mostly working in the 1920s and very early 1930s when the real excesses of Stalin and the terror had not yet appeared. There was a lot of experimentation, relative amount of freedom for uh, uh, creativity in the arts uh, and in uh, education, uh, as well as in the economy in the 1920s. <clears throat> so what was he really talking about? This is a very kind of brief and, of course, highly inadequate summary of his main ideas. And if you look at the reading list that uh, is provided, you find you know, entire books that are devoted to one aspect of some of these things. But human psychology is a process of development, and the aim or the goal of that development is creation or cultivation of these higher mental processes. Uh, activity, interaction between people, supports development. And more knowledgeable people, 
whether they're teachers, guides, more sophisticated, more experienced adults, uh, support development by uh, showing the way, if you will. Collaboration and social interaction, therefore, are essential. And encourage, this is very important for his view, encouraging the development of these higher mental processes requires that you master the tools, the signs and symbols uh, that mediate them. So we'll say a word about that more in just a second. Um, what Vygotsky meant by higher mental processes was really thinking, speech, creative acts, <clears throat> and therefore education ought to focus on how we bring those to the fore. And his interest, he was, he was interested in sort of the extremes of human psychological experience. On the one hand, very interested, as, as we've said, in art, literature, criticism, and so on. But he was also interested in the things that delay development or prevent development or, or discourage development from happening or point it in some uh, less productive direction. So he's very interested in neural psychology and in language disorders and in fact was affiliated with institutions that studied these things up to the end of his life. And these are things that society has to be concerned about because they place limits on people. They limit people's ability to interact with others, to create new, uh, higher kinds of expressions of human creativity, uh, and they limit people's ability to collaborate with each other. Well, activity, working with other people is very important. Um, and as Davidov, we'll come back to him, <clears throat> Davidov said, the, the subject of all activity is the collective subject. In other words, it's not just individuals working on their own. It's people working together to try to resolve issues, come up with new ideas, et cetera. So collaboration and social interaction are really essential. When Vygotsky was, he, he was sort of out of favor for about 50 years, but when he began to be studied again and taken seriously in the mid 80s in Russia, one of the terms that was used commonly to talk about his impact uh, was this idea of the pedagogy of collaboration, pedagogica sotrudnicistva, um, which really meant in order to learn, you have to be collaborative. You have to be interacting with other people. But you also do that in a way that's individualized. You don't just do it in a kind of mass production sort of way. So the idea that Vygotsky is best known for in this country is what's called the zone of uh, proximal development or proximal education, educational development, zoped sometimes. In Russia, zona blizhaishiva razvitya, um, which, that, you know, proximal is like, what does that mean? Nobody knows what proximal means. But in Russian, it just sounds, it's just close. It's just nearest. It's the closest educational development. The, 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 the development that can take place when you are at a stage that has not yet fully appeared. So this idea of you try to catch the moment when a student is just beginning to understand by looking at other people, hearing other people talk about stuff, ah, that's a new word. How can I use that word? And then eventually they try it out and they begin to use it for themselves. And eventually it just becomes second nature. They just start using it. So that process of flowering, of making something your own is really essential uh, to his notion of education. Uh, first you do something, you see something done, and then you can do it sort of with a little bit of assistance, and then you practice it a few times, and then eventually it becomes like part of your internal landscape, part of the way that you see and work in the world. And so the guide or the upbringer, the vaspitatil in Russia, uh, has to be able to understand where the child or the learner is and then where, what they're capable of and where they may need assistance. It's not a one-size-fits-all interaction. It's very tailored to the particular place and needs of the individual. So what did he mean by psychological tools? Because this was very important for him, not just pens and pencils. Um, computers, I don't think, but computer software, maybe. I think this, this is a really interesting, and there's a, a book on the reading list that really addresses this about uh, uh, cognition and technology. Uh, <clears throat> they are th mediators. They are things that come between the natural world that use sign and symbol systems to promote human development and to pass information and culture along 
from person to person and uh, age to age. So language is central and language gets internalized. And this is a very interesting thing. It, it, it's not as if you're constantly talking to yourself in your head. It's that you're use, as, through using language, you come to develop a kind of mental shorthand that allows you to quickly encompass large chunks, if you will, of concepts into a, into a, uh, a, a shorter, briefer form. Mathematics was also very important for him as this kind of symbol system. I think if he had been around a little bit later, he, he would have been fascinated and amazed at the emergence of things like Laba notation, which is a dance annotation format if you're a choreographer and you want to capture the specific motions that a dancer uses to be able to communicate them to others, you use that sort of system. There's a guy named Edward Tufte. If you have come across him, he's, a, he's wonderful. Just look at his books. You know, there, he's got like four books out at this point, um, <clears throat> mostly dealing with graphics and visual representations. Uh, absolutely fascinating. I would have loved to hear a conversation between him and Vygotsky because uh, I think they would have had a huge amount in common because those graphic symbol systems and, and visual representations are more and more uh, part of the way that we work in the world. If you look at uh, the field that I work in uh, for my other half of my brain is what's called learning analytics and that's very much taken with visual representations of data as students make progress through an educational system. You learn these things mostly uh, from other humans. You learn them through uh, direct interaction with them, but you also learn them through written material um, and through the records that they've created and left. So this is what Jim Wirch, who's a major uh, American interpreter of Vygotsky, calls dialogicality. It's a great word, uh, kind of messy, but it's, it's basically you're in dialogue with these people, whether you are uh, directly in their presence or whether they died 300 years ago. You are in dialogue with them. And as I've said already, the use of these tools is first external and then eventually becomes internal. <clears throat> so all of this stuff, which might seem random and unconnected, is actually deeply linked. The, the processes of human development, the development of language and the sort of flowering of it as a person uh, matures, and the concomitant uh, development of people's ability to think. And the expression of those thinking abilities through not just art, but other kinds of creative products. Might, it might be a mathematical formula, might be a new software program, might be something that is uh, you know, a, a distinctively creative approach to you know, management or uh, uh, organization. All of this is in a context of human social interaction. I love this. This is actually the cover of a, uh, of a Russian uh, book for university students on Vygotsky, and I think it's a, it's a great representation of that, so that notion of people. But notice they're, they're not really looking at each other, right? They're all looking kind of off in the distance. Well, Vygotsky got involved uh, in his later career in a movement that was popular around Russia, but also in Western Europe, uh, called pedology, which was really uh, very similar to the notions of uh, educational psychology in the USA and in Europe. Um, Edward Thorndike, uh, you know, very focused on use of testing as a way to measure development and see where an individual stands vis-a-vis -vis others. Uh, this was a new scientific tool, and the Russian psychologists felt this could be useful. They could figure out where people were and you know Marxism was all focused on science so they should use these kinds of tools. But when they tried to create actual schools using those tools, guess who came out on top? Oh, it's the children of the bourgeoisie, the bankers, the plant managers, the intellectuals, the college professors. They're all showing up great on these tests and the kids of the workers and the peasants and you know the soldiers, not so well. And it was really before we recognized this powerful impact of socioeconomic status on uh, and family on uh, early uh, childhood development. So Vygotsky, uh, even though he was closely involved with this movement uh, at the time of his death, the movement itself did not do so well, as we'll see in just a second. Um, so it was not officially banned until after his death, but in the early 30s, it was coming under a lot of scrutiny and there were a lot of criticisms of it. So Stalin thought it was too focused on the individual. 
assumes that psychological development is maybe superior to the social and economic conditions, which wouldn't be in accord with Marxism. So in 1936, the uh, Communist Party came out with this decree against pedagogical distortions in the system of public education. And the word in Russian is izvrashenia, which is, it's a tougher word than distortions. It's like perversions. It's like really bad changes. So the pedologists were not liquidated, not in the sense of being shot, but they were basically told, go back to the classroom. You know, you need to, you need to uh, <clears throat> get your ideas uh, back in line with the official ideology. Vygotsky died in 1934. Here's his grave in, uh, in Moscow and the famous Novodievichy Cemetery. And I think we can just see, uh, <clears throat> notice this is, this is him. This is his wife, Rosa. And these are their kids, Gita and Asya, two daughters. And notice that uh, the name, as we mentioned at the very beginning, the name changed from T. Vygotsky to Vygodskaya, the Russian feminine form of the name. Uh, in uh, the time of their lives, the daughters' lives. Uh, I heard Gita speak at a conference in 1996, and she was trying to debunk rumors that her father had been, had been killed, had been uh, you know, done in by the KGB. He said, no, no, he died of tuberculosis. I was at home when he died, although she was only like a couple of years old, I think, when, when he died. Um, anyway, knowing Russian society and how skilled Russians often are at dissembling, it's, I don't know. I don't think that he was killed by the KGB, but the fact is that he was closely connected with this movement that was sort of under official censure at the time of his death uh, is uh, interesting. Well, <clears throat> what happened? In uh, the uh, 1930s, the work on pedology and individually oriented psychology kind of was uh, blacklisted, went underground. The ZOPED, the Zone of uh, Proximal Development, continued as a concept, but it was really thought of more in a collectivist way, as like how do you bring a whole class of kids or a whole group of kids along. And uh, Davidov said in 1995, actually he was at a conference right here in, in Atlanta, uh, he said that um, you could only read his book, Pedagogical Psychology, by getting a special pass from the KGB to go to the Lenin Library and go to a special reading room uh, where they would give you that book and you had to sit right there and couldn't take any notes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> and I just think this is so fascinating. It's like, what could you imagine being in a educational psychology text today that would be so provocative, you know, that you'd need special permission from the FBI to go read it? I mean, it's like, how could that be? But um, he did leave a very strong legacy in terms of a group of followers that continue to develop and continue to extend his work. Um, this guy Luria, fascinating studies of uh, uh, n uh, native peoples living in the far north where they were not exposed to alphabetic culture and what, how did their thinking change as they came in contact uh, with alphabetical literacy. Uh, he also studied uh, war veterans after World War II who had been brain damaged and how could they recover uh, their ability to read and write and so on. Uh, these other names are all well known in, in Russia, Yelkonin, Shedrovitsky, Zinchenko. These, a lot of these are dynasties, you know, like I knew that these guys are, are both, uh, like Yelkonin and Shedrovitsky are both dead, but I knew both of their sons. Uh, over there, Repkin was a guy in Kharkov. There was a sort of separate school of, of Vygotskian studies. And this guy Davidov, Vasily Vasilievich Davidov, who was, I think, a, he, he's a wonderful guy. I knew him pretty well. Um, I interacted with him, uh, translated for him, um, uh, helped him when he came here, and also uh, was uh, sort of introduced by him over there to quite a few interesting people. Uh, <clears throat> He's remarkable for two reasons. Number one, he loved, uh, in contrast to a lot of these other guys, he loved going into the schools and actually looking at what was happening in classrooms and talking with teachers and talking with kids. He loved that, which not a lot of education, even here now, a lot, not a lot of them do that sort of thing. Anyway, but he also was like a, um, a, an upholder of human rights. Um, 
I'll just say quickly that he was under censure in the last years of the Soviet regime, officially because he'd published something that wasn't quite in accord with the ideology, unofficially because they came to him and they said, you have too many Jews working in your institute, we want you to fire 50% of them. He said, I'm not going to fire those, those are my most productive people, I'm not going to fire those people. They said, okay, you're out. And they literally banned him, you know, they, they removed him from the directorship of that institute. He was kind of persona non grata for quite a few years, but he wouldn't back down, you know. And um, he used to, at, at public functions, I heard him do this three different times, he would sing a Russian revolutionary song uh, called uh, Brave Sea, Holy Baikal. And one of the lines in there is, O Zhilya Volu Pachuya, I came back to life having felt my will. And I think that was him. That was his own experience. He came back to life having, ex having sort of allowed himself to recognize his own uh, individuality. So in the 80s, time of perestroika, they rediscovered Vygotsky, they began to talk about him again, and it was uh, okay to think about the role of the individual in society. And this is a wonderful kind of contrast. This is a painting that Norman Rockwell did in 1967 of a Soviet classroom. People, people sit, seated in rows, but look at this guy. You know, he's the, he's the outlier. This is Vygotsky as a youth. He's staring out the window while everybody else is, you know, directly pointed straight ahead. They've all got their hands in the same position books on the table, here's the bust of Lenin, here's the flowers that they brought in for Lenin, and on the wall is a slogan that says, Uchitsa, Uchitsa, study, 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 which was a quote from Lenin, supposedly. Anyway, contemporary Russian classroom, you know, kids are working individually, they're working in small groups. Here's a teacher back here, it's not quite clear what she's doing, but this is more the norm now in Russian schools. They look like more like, you know, Western classrooms. So why did these ideas click so much after 1985? So the development of the individual, uh, Davidov loved to use this example of the Savok. So Savok is like a little garden tool. And they said the, the Soviet educational system was geared to the production of Savki, of, of these little crude implements. In other words, you prepare a, wor a person to be a worker in a factory, they don't have to know that much. You just give them the basic skills and you shove them out the door. But um, Davida thought that this was wrong and that you should really focus on development. Uh, this notion of, of human culture as a higher form of mental activity uh, coincided with the rediscovery of the humanities in Russia and in Russian schools. And the slogan that they used at this time was the humanization and humanitarization of education. It sounds horrible in English, and it sounded pretty bad in Russian, too. But it, hum, humanization just meant making the relationships between teachers and students less confrontational, less authoritarian. Humanitarization just meant bringing back more humanities, arts, literature, et cetera, uh, instead of the huge focus that they had had on you know, math, science, physics, and so on. And also important to note that Vygotsky was a native son, so they, they were aware of and they were bringing in ideas from people like Piaget and Montessori and Steiner, but Vygotsky was their own. And they could hold him up and they could say, look, we've got somebody too who can compete in this sort of international marketplace of ideas. There were a lot of places that were really putting um, Vygotsky's ideas into practice. Davidov had a whole school. Uh, and he, together with uh, Yelkonen, developed this uh, approach to teaching, especially teaching math. And there was a trial here in the U.S., several places back in the early 2000s, um, that was pretty interesting. I actually was part of some of the work on it. But uh, it didn't go over so well with American teachers and especially school boards because the whole point was you don't introduce numbers until grade two. <laughs> I'm a first grade teacher and I'm supposed to teach math without teaching numbers? How do I do that? Well, they had it all figured out. It was actually, it was quite ingenious, but I think it was too complex, you know, to try to communicate to uh, teachers generally. The Shedrovitsky's father and son came up with this idea of so-called organizational activity games, it's kind of a combination of, of simulations and group therapy and encounter group. It was focused on things like social development and community development and, uh, organizational development and so on. Very interesting sort of movement. Uh, 
Uh, and then Aryolok, which is a little bit outside of Vygotsky's domain, but it was all sort of c connected in a very uh, basic way. Um, Aryolok was a summer camp uh, for kids down on the Black Sea. And one of my close uh, friends from Russia described it as a camp for communist fundamentalists. Well, what did that mean? In other words, they, weren't mar they, were, they were Marxists, but not Leninists or Stalinists. They wanted to really take Marx's ideas and see if they could enact them. So really very collaborative, supportive, and so on. And the so-called social pedagogical movement that I was closely connected with for quite a few years uh, originated there back in the 70s and 80s. Here's this people uh, associated with this movement. I worked very closely with this guy, Soloviechik, and with this guy, Adamski, and I, this is uh, Sofia Lysenkova. I visited her classroom. I just immediately walking in, I thought, if I were a first grader, I would want to be here because she was so welcoming, supportive, but she also very demanding and she was, and, and very, uh, structured. She would give to, now I want you to form that letter a little bit differently so you'll be able to form it more quickly. You know, it was just like, wow, this is, this is amazing stuff. She wrote several books and was very highly honored, uh, but not initially because she was thought of as being too far outside the mold. Uh, this guy, Adamski, created this group called Evrika or Eureka, which came to have uh, branches all across the country. And then most of these people are members of what were called the teacher innovators. Um, <clears throat> my daughter studied in this guy's school in Moscow, Tubelsky. He was a theater guy, you know. He wasn't, a, he wasn't trained as an educator and he had the kids doing all these plays and, and uh, celebrations and things. Well, what were we doing when Vygotsky was, was active in Russia? Jean Piaget, uh, the Swiss uh, psychologist, uh, was a developmentalist and uh, very popular, very influential, but his approach was much more sort of stage-based and biologically determined. B.F. Skinner, who I'm not that fond of, I recognize behaviorism, but Skinner's approach, you know, really sort of dismissed the inner workings of the mind, and I think he, poisoned is probably too strong a word, but he certainly had a very strong influential impact on American educational thinking. You just think of the Skinner boxes, the teaching machines, the programmed instruction movement of the 70s and 80s and so on. Um, Bruner was uh, much more interesting and really interested in the forms of representation, uh, how you develop concepts over time. Uh, and Bronfenbrenner, who himself was born in Russia, uh, taught in this country for most of his life, uh, back in 1970, wrote a book called Two Worlds of Childhood, U.S. and USSR, which um, nowadays most people would say it, it, it was too uncritical of the uh, Soviet system. Was anyone thinking about uh, education and learning and development in the same ways as Vygotsky? Well, I think George Herbert Mead is probably the best example, uh, although he's working a little before Vygotsky, uh, he really talked about uh, social interaction as a kind of theatrical uh, event. And you uh, thought of your relationships with other people in terms of how you shared meanings uh, through interaction. And more recently, Irving Goffman, the guy who wrote the presentation of self in everyday life, did a similar kind of analysis. Very interesting. So people have been thinking in these kinds of ways. Principal among the Western champions has been Michael Cole. Uh, <clears throat> and there's this interesting difference of opinion now of what was originally uh, translated as thought and language. Many people now say, well, that doesn't really, because it's not really just language, it's speech. And so uh, thinking in speech is probably a better um, way of, of expressing that title. And it's also within the translation of the, wor of the work itself early translations, the people who translated it said, well, we just threw out all this Marxist stuff because we thought it was just political claptrap and they just had to put that in in order to please the censors. Well, actually, it was real. You know, it played a role. And so people are going back and kind of unearthing all this stuff. Other people who have been very <coughs> um, influential, uh, Jim Wirch uh, and uh, Irkia Engström, who's in Finland, and Louis Moll, who's here, um, have all been uh, very important as kind of interpreters. A lot of their names are on that uh, reading list. And this guy, Stephen Toolman, 
who came up with this term that you still see used in discussions about Vygotsky, the Mozart of psychology, because he could do so many different things, worked in so many different fields. This is a, uh, a review that appeared back in 1978 in the New York Review Books. I recommend this. It's a great, quick introduction to Vygotsky's ideas. You probably have to get it. It's, it's I think, not generally available online, you could, but you could get it by interlibrary loan. Well, <clears throat> in the 1980s, American educational psychologists began taking note of Vygotsky's ideas, uh, these ideas of uh, design-based research, reciprocal teaching, cognitive apprenticeship, and scaffolding, all are directly related back to Vygotsky's ideas. The Jean Leib and Etienne Wenger uh, materials on communities of practice, professional learning communities, very similar. Idea that you learn from each other, you learn in a connected way, by interacting with each other. And uh, for organizational and management studies, the emergence of what's called CHAT, or cultural historical activity theory. And design-based research, which we men mentioned before, uh, which is really a way, you're not trying to make grand generalizations about how people learn. You're trying to create learning environments that are going to be supportive and help people uh, become more proficient uh, through progressive, relatively small-scale iteration tweaking of educational materials and products. Uh, learning sciences emerged in the 1990s, kind of a combination of anthropology, psychology, sociology, uh, and uh, computer science, anthropology, and so on. Journal of the Learning Sciences and International Conference. My own colleague, John Bransford, was very instrumental in this, in this uh, National Academy's press book, How People Learn, emerged uh, out of their work. Um, this is a great introduction to sort of how Vygotsky is being channeled and interpreted today, I think. And chat uh, <clears throat> in the workplace, here's Engus Rome that I mentioned, uh, runs the center at the University of Helsinki. And if you look at chat, uh, you'll often come across things that look like this. This is a so-called activity diagram, activity system diagram. <clears throat> it's very, actually very productive and very useful uh, for thinking about uh, these kinds of relationships. Uh, and we've recently rediscovered uh, Vygotsky's psychology of art and play and creative action. Uh, Sobkin, uh, this guy, uh, I, I, went, I got this book when I was there in October. I've known him for years, and, and he said, well, he said, you might be interested in this. It's a thick book. I came home, and I told my colleague at the University of Washington, who's like a Vygotsky specialist, I said, I've got this new book. I said, I brought it to show you. She said, we have to get this translated. I said, really? She said, yeah, because this is where the interest is now. This is where the interest in um, uh, creativity and uh, psychology is kind of coming back. And this other book by Lois Holtzman, Vygotsky at Work and Play, uh, she runs this very interesting outfit called the East Side Institute for Short-Term Psychotherapy in New York City, which does like group therapy, social uh, development, community development, um, you know, consulting on organizational effectiveness, nonprofits, and things like that. Fascinating stuff. There's also this book by Yasnitsky and Vanderveer called Revolutionist Revolution in Vygotsky Studies, and the Russians themselves are doing some of that. <clears throat> so what are the implications of all of this? Well, I think one is that outsiders can significantly affect understanding within a scientific field. Uh, the outsider brings different perspectives and can shake things up. The shaking doesn't always, isn't always productive in the short term, but over time it can be uh, effective, and it's especially difficult when political and cultural norms are challenged. Another implication, I think, is this notion of psychological tools and the way, in, you know, in Vygotsky's time we didn't really have much, but now we have, you know, Siri, and we have all of the sort of cognitive helpers that are emerging uh, out of technology. Salomon and Perkins call this cognitive amplification. And I think this is going to be very interesting to watch. And Vygotsky himself was aware of this. He and Sergei Eisenstein, the film director, actually were friends. They talked a lot. And I, again, another, another case where I would have loved to be a fly on the wall. Uh, and finally, and this I think is really the, um, the, the challenge of the future, this guy, Viliano Ramachandran, who's at UC San Diego, uh, which is also the same place where Michael Cole is, interestingly, has been studying what are called mirror neurons. And 
if you hit a nail with a hammer, a certain set of neurons in your brain fire. When you watch somebody else hitting a nail with a hammer, a related but not exactly the same set of neurons in your brain fire. So he thinks that this is maybe a lot of the basis for human empathy, human learning. He talks about it as the unity of sciences and the humanities. You can find him on uh, uh, TED Talks. He's done, uh, he's done quite a few. Uh, this is still conjectural. There's not a lot of evidence around this yet, but I think in terms of bringing Vygotsky's notions into today, this is a, a very interesting approach. So at, I think we can see Vygotsky as kind of the grain of sand in the pearl oyster of psychology, if you excuse that metaphor. Uh, I think he's, a, you know, he's an outsider. He's a person whose ideas grew and became more significant over time. And uh, he's a person who continues to be uh, developed. That is, his ideas continue to be uh, elaborated upon today. So that's the end. I say in Russian, spasibo lyova, which means thank you, Lev. Uh, and welcome your comments or questions or responses. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. On the macro level in Russia, how prevalent you say it's coming back some you gave some examples, but Well, it it was this this was a very big part of what went on in education in the nineteen eighties. Um, and it did have a it did have an impact that is uh, so when I began to go there uh, and talked with people about their experiences in the education system, I often got comments like, well, you know, I had very strict teachers. They were very severe. Uh, they punished me if I got the wrong answer. And I actually saw this in classrooms. You know, you go into a classroom. In America, student doesn't, <clears throat> doesn't get an answer right. And the teacher says, well, Jimmy, you know, you probably should think about that a little bit. And uh, Jane, what did you think? You know, in Russian classrooms, student gets up gives the wrong answer, teacher says, very bad, Jimmy, sit down, you haven't studied enough. You know, it's like, a, it's like an insult, it's like a denigration of that person and, a, and a, a canceling out of their humanity. So you can just imagine Russian kids having to cope with that. Um, the uh, 1980s brought a kind of uh, revulsion towards that and a lot of this business about humanization and pedagogy of collaboration really had to do with trying to get teachers to lighten up on their, on their kids in their classes. Um, it had to do with, uh, you know, recognizing that not all kids learned in exactly the same way or at the same rate. Uh, and it had to do with trying to encourage teachers to think of themselves not necessarily as friends to kids, but not as their opponents, you know. And there was, there was so much sort of negative stuff. I think that the sort of powerful centralizing and cultural norms around education continue to be a factor. And so if you go into a Russian classroom today, it still looks, well, I, I, showed, a, I showed kind of the best example <laughs> that I could find. Uh, it still, in many cases, is going to look much more kind of controlled and regimented than would an American classroom. Yeah, yeah. These ideas spread much more quickly in the urban areas. Uh, while Russia has done a lot to try to sort of equalize the position of, of rural kids, um, it's still not perfect by any means. I've visited quite a few rural schools, and I mean, the reality is, you know, you think of a rural school in the U.S., and, well, you know, maybe the physical plant is not so great. Maybe the building looks a little worn around the edges. Maybe the textbooks are 10 years old. But it's still, you know, sort of recognizable as a school. In a Russian rural school, I visited one a few years ago. So one inside water tap in the lunchroom so that kids could wash their hands before they sat down to eat lunch. No indoor plumbing, uh, outhouses. Um, 
indoor heating provided only by a kind of rickety uh, steam-based system that uh, the teachers said in the winter left the classrooms at about 50 degrees. So, you know, these are not ideal conditions uh, under anybody's definition. And the Russians at that time in the, in the 90s uh, loved to point out that under the Soviet system, the officially state-mandated uh, cost for construction per square meter for a school, I don't remember what it was, but it was something like, uh, you know, 10 rubles per square meter, whereas the comparable cost for construction of a pig pigsty was 30 rubles per square meter, so they're spending more on the pigsties than they were on the schools. So it's a, uh, you know, it was, a, it was a, a, not an easy job to get these kinds of changes implemented uh, in rural schools in Russia. But there have been, you know, there some of these, these innovators, quote unquote, worked in rural schools and tried to develop, you know, those systems to have a basis in, uh, in rural school activity. Yes. Professor Kerr, uh, thank you for coming today. We're very grateful for this information. Um, can you talk a little bit about the um, it's sort of a chicken and egg question? Did the Marxist ideas influence him, or did he adopt the Marxist ideas or symbiotic? Or yeah, I don't. That's an interesting question, and I don't know. I I don't know that we actually have enough information about his early life, you know, to be able to answer that. Uh, I did mention this guy Ashpiz, who was his, his tutor uh, when he was growing up in Gomel, um, who was, a, he was known as a social activist. You know, so he was clearly uh, exposed to those kinds of ideas at an early age. And the fact that he dropped out of Moscow University, which was like, that's the, that's the Harvard you know, of the educational system. He drops out before he graduates and goes over to this sort of weird, you know, it's almost like going to an alternative school or something. where, but. The, the Shanyavsky was actually, that university was known as sort of the happening place. That was where a lot of professors from Moscow University went over there to teach because they thought it was more interesting. The students were more interesting, they could have more lively discussions and so on. So he was clearly kind of attracted to this. I think his, you know, his interest in this theatrical stuff, it was like, well, we can, we can imagine the world in a lot of different ways and now, uh, is a time of rapid change, so let's get to it. You know, let's dig into it. So I, I think the fact that he was, you know, he was clearly, as I say, clearly a Marxist, but not a state. He wasn't like focused on this heavy-handed state control, thought monitoring, you know, censorship of publication. That wasn't who what he was about. So he only was uh, abroad once, as far as we know. He went to London for a conference, I think, in 1926, and. Um, uh, you know, clearly was learning these other languages so that he could be in... I, I have not looked at uh, his correspondence, and there may be studies of his correspondence with, like, German and French uh, psychologists and so on. I know it's hard to generalize, but do you think um, there's more or less emphasis on the arts and the educational system of... Russia today as compared to the United States, or with oh boy, <clears throat> I mean, the, is there an emphasis on one area there's, another? There, there's some. There's more now than there was under the Soviet regime. You know, you look at the curriculum for high schools under the Soviet system. Four years of physics, three years of chemistry, two years of biology. You know, and that mostly came at the expense of literature, arts, et cetera. They had some study of it, but after uh, the Perestroika, they began to develop uh, special schools that had a focus on arts, literature, and so on. And um, uh, they, they still exist, and some of them are very, are very popular and very are flourishing. Um, I think in the US, you know, we've tended to view the arts as a kind of an extraneous part of the curriculum. Uh, unfortunately, and so they tend to be the ones to get cut, you know, when there are budget cuts. Um, although now, I think there's, you know, there's kind of a growing awareness, which I think Vygotsky would hugely support, that creativity in math, science, physics, you know, the STEM fields, uh, is really supported by exposure to arts, and it, it blows up your thinking, you know, it really allows you to see the world in a lot of different ways. So, 
I think they're aware of that, and certainly in the best schools in the, in the, uh, and in the, especially in the cities, uh, you, d you do see this. You see a lot of this. Uh, relative weight, U.S. versus Russia, really hard to tell. I don't know. You, you need to figure out what the metrics are that you look at it with. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck.